Thor, the incredibly arrogant son of Odin, wins the hammer and decides to become king, but Odin then swipes his hammer away and all that. So basically in Thor 1, um, Loki basically makes Thor look like a complete jerk-off, and then Th Odin then banishes his favorite son to Earth, and he basically learns humility and falls in love with a really pretty actress woman who's also a really great physicist scientist. And meanwhile, Loki learns that he is a frost giant baby, and then, uh, I don't know, decides to take vengeance, but he's incredibly charismatic. But then Odin's all like, hey, I have to sleep now. So then once Odin falls into the quote unquote Odin sleep, Loki decides to uh, take the rightful reign of Asgard or something like that. And then he gets the giant destruction thing and descends it upon the two blocks of New Mexico that Thor himself has fallen onto. And without a horse, uh, Thor decides to uh, sacrifice his own whatever. And then uh, he kisses Jane, and then he goes back to Asgard, and then he fights Loki, and then Loki falls into a pit, and then everyone's okay, but then the bridge is broken, so then they, Thor needs like MacGuffin magic to get back to Earth when he gets to Avengers, where Loki is then infecting people with the quote-unquote cosmic cube that appeared in Death America. I'm losing you guys, aren't I? Hey guys, I'm Evan uh, on the youngfolks.com. I'm here traveling elsewhere. Allie's somewhere, still in Boston, uh, this week. Um, so she talked about Rush with you guys this week, and I just saw Thor The Dark World, as did most other people. So I just wanted to take a moment and talk to you guys about it, because I'm a super nerd. John, also on the site, uh, he reviewed it on the site uh, earlier this week, so you guys can go check that out. And I'm going to start off this video by saying that I mostly agree with whatever it is that you said. Oh, uh, okay, all right, okay, that's, that's what... Okay, okay, I, that's a good point. John made a point in his review, and I definitely, most definitely agree with this. Uh, Thor The Dark World is misleading in that it's going to be a movie uh, that has a much darker tone to it than we had in our uh, little two-block of New Mexico adventure that we had in the first Thor movie. But it tends to be uh, just another light-hearted science fiction uh, action movie. Which is fine, you know, it's just that, you know, the only sequels that we have to these Marvel movies now at this point are kind of like, you know more of the same. I'm looking at you, John Favreau, with Iron Man 2. Sorry. But Rick, let's break it down a little bit for you guys here. So we have Thor uh, now back, back in Asgard with a newly furnished Rainbow Bridge which we, with which he can travel back to Midgard and see Jane. Uh, but he's uh, really busy in a uh, war because there's a uh, convergence uh, alignment, uh, kind of like an eclipse of all these different nine realms of this tree of magicalness uh, that we have through the Thor universe. Um, so he's really busy fighting battles and uh, Natalie's just kind of, sorry, Jane, is just kind of bumbling around, being romantic about him, kind of forgetting that she's a bit of a scientist. So we find Jane in London uh, in a really awkward date with Chris O'Dowd. Hey, um, and uh, Kat Dennings out of nowhere just comes and says, hey, you gotta check this out. Uh, this is a plot device for the rest of the movie. Um, <laughs> so they find these portals with the, these kids who suddenly have telekinetic powers and they never really explain that. It's a little weird. So then uh, Jane finds herself walking into a portal and finding this uh, giant brick that looks like the monolith from 2001 to Space Odyssey. And uh, lo and behold, it is an ancient evil dark matter that is called the at there? Eat there? Yeah, um, that. So she gets infected with this uh, thing that looks like the symbiote from Spider-Man 3. <coughs> All of a sudden, our uh, wonderful doorman of Asgard, uh, Heimdall, as played again by Aegis Elba, is like, uh, uh oh, Thor, you better go see her. And then he comes down with the rain. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, the audience is sitting there wondering when Loki's gonna show up. And we do get a couple of scenes of Loki, but they were clearly reshoots. Uh, for the movie because of the huge amount of fan reaction going on with uh, his character in Thor and the Avengers. Um, it's it's definitely, this movie is consistently trying to give you fan service. People liked Kat Dennings, people liked Stellan Sarsgaard, they liked the comedy bits, they, lo they loved Loki, and people wanted to see uh, more of Asgard as well. I remember uh, myself even thinking in the first Thor movie, we spend so much time with Thor with these humans on Earth, they like learning this humility, but uh, Asgard is a potentially crazy looking place, uh, and there's so much fantasy going on there, and we don't see too much of it, especially Anthony Hopkins sleeping half the time. And then we, they give us more of it in this movie, and it kind of just falls apart. 
Okay, but let's talk about the actors for a second. Chris Hemsworth, he owns the role. He's going to be Thor. He's always Thor. He's he just as much owns the role of Thor as Robert Downey Jr. does as Iron Man. It just depends on the character's popularity. Uh, Natalie Portman, I remember hearing that she wasn't really excited to go and do this sequel. So, I mean, she's just... She's just as Natalie Portman as you're going to get in every other movie. Kat Dennings, never really cared for her character, always found her obnoxious and her kind of comic relief. And then Stellan Sarsgaard, we get to see twice run around naked at Stonehenge. Um, I don't know. Tom Hiddleston, always, always is commanding the screen anytime he's on. Just anytime that he's not on the screen as Loki, you're just kind of like, ah, I'm kind of waiting for him to come back. Anthony Hopkins, um, he's just a great, great actor. I respect him immensely. I could tell he didn't care about this movie. He was just kind of walking through. He was he was already drifting back in the Odin sleep walking through this movie, seriously. Um, Idris Elba, he's in it for like five minutes. Um, and you have your villain, the Dark Elves. Now, they're kind of like the elves from Lord of the Rings, but evil and they have mannequin masks. Christopher Eggleston, a great actor, the ninth Doctor Who, um, is completely wasted on a fully makeup, subtitled villain uh, with really no motivation other than just like pure evil from an ancient story. That's pretty much it. I mean, the, the it, it, it was so interchangeable with the Frost Giants from the first movie, but at least the Frost Giants had some kind of like personality to them. These characters were literally blank faces. And it, there was just like, maybe there was like one that was like really creepy and bulked up. That's one thing that I can give this movie credit for. It had an amazing look. The people that did the art direction for this movie and the special effects, they really loved working on it. And you could tell just watching it. It's a, the, probably one of the prettiest looking of movies uh, that Marvel has put out. So let's talk about spoilers a little bit. Um, I, I think that the way that they handled uh, Loki's trickster uh, movements, his, his, uh, his little games that he plays. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal that eventually ended up being a cop-out. Um, I thought that was really awesome that the way that they handled Loki's involvement, Thor's really super secret uh, escape plan with uh, with Jane uh, to make some kind of... I don't even know what he was trying to do. That, that, that made no sense to me. The way that he tried to, like, lightning bolt the Aether when it's supposed to be the most powerful, one of the most indestructible matters of evil in the universe, and he thinks that a little lightning's going to do it. When, but the way that they were building up to it, um, especially once they started getting Loki involved, I was having a lot of fun with it, and I particularly liked uh, Loki's uh, Captain America impression. That really got a chuckle out of me. But other than building up to that moment, uh, which is maybe only about two-thirds through the movie, there's a whole third act left after that, there wasn't, I didn't feel like there was a lot of plot going on. So the movie suffered from, obviously, you know, poor uh, plot development, but really poor editing, because when there were actually a couple of really uh, intimate moments going on, there was something else going on in between that kind of broke it up, especially when there was some really intense moments going on over in Asgard, especially, like, you know, like after, like, Thor's, Thor and Loki's mother's death. Sorry, spoiler alert, guys. Um, and we all of a sudden cut to uh, Stellan Sarsgaard. Again, his character's in crazy jail. And there's a Stan Lee cameo. Um, it, it just completely, it completely broke up the emotional tone of the movie, or what little was there. Now, was the movie funny? Pretty consistently, but it, it, the, the story that I was trying to put together didn't really call for that. Now, let's get to something that I am really looking forward to talking about. We got, as, to, as per usual with a Marvel movie, uh, post credit stinger to tease an upcoming movie. This April, we got Captain America the Winter Soldier, which has a great trailer that just came out. I'll put the link here. Guardians of the Galaxy. So Guardians of the Galaxy is essentially a uh, new uh, property um, that's actually not all that popular. And like, I mean, people that read the comics absolutely love it, but it hasn't really been utilized. As I, was, I was shocked among a lot of other people that they're going to be making a movie out of it. So the director for this movie is James Gunn, who has done Slither and uh, Super. There was uh, some Comic-Con footage that was released, that, uh, released this past year. People are really, really enjoying the tone of the movie. And then all of a sudden this stinger came up, at least from what I can tell, the reception online, is that people are a little thrown off about it. I know that when I first saw this uh, stinger, uh, let me set it up for you. You have uh, Lady Sif and uh, Volstagg, uh, you know, two of... Uh, Thor's companion characters, and they're being led through this strange tight corridor with creepy rubber 
prosthetic creatures. She introduces them to, we have Benicio del Toro as a character called the Collector. Um, and they give him a box containing the ether um, as, as a result of um, Thor eventually getting it out of Malekith the Dark Elf. Um, so they hand the, these two hand the, uh, the collector this ether, and he warns them about how dangerous it is to keep it with him. And they claim, look, we already have one of these things. It's called an infinity stone. And they hint that this other infinity stone they're referring to is, in fact, the cosmic cube, the tesseract, this blue cube that um, was featured in uh, the original Thor and in Captain America and was Loki's main device in uh, the Avengers of whatever kind of destruction he was trying to cause. His motivations are so confusing to me. Loki, just suck it up. And then they walk away, and the Collector then mutters to himself, something or other, two down, four to go. Now, what does this mean? This means that we have an allusion to the Infinity Gems. The Infinity Gems are something that is used to power a device. It's called the Infinity Gauntlet. It's a crazy gold gauntlet, and it's actually got a brief kind of sight cameo in the first Thor movie. You have the Soul Gem, the Time Gem, the Space Gem, the Mind Gem, the Reality Gem, and the Power. I'm understanding the Cosmic Cube that we had in our Phase 1 of Marvel movies, the Tesseract, um, you have as the space stone. And that makes sense because basically what happened is that the Tesseract was used, it sucked up the Red Skull into a portal. Um, the, I know the Tesseract's power uh, threw Loki down into some abyss and he used its uh, ability, it, it, he used its powers to get all these aliens into Manhattan. So obviously it's a space gem because it's a trans-dimensional device. And, and now in Thor, you know, it's an, again, interchangeable kind of MacGuffin plot device. We have the Aether, which is an all-powerful dark magic. So this means that we now have existing in our Marvel movie universe uh, two of supposedly what's going to be six uh, Infinity Stones. And the Infinity Gauntlet in our comics history is to be seeked out and used by Thanos. Uh, Thanos is the purple dude that you saw in that little stinger at the end of the Avengers. He's got, he's got the Ron Perlman chin, he starts grinning, and very, very creepy, and everyone just got confused. Um, this is setting up a huge galactic universe here, and Thanos is basically the, the destroyer. Like, he is probably the most formidable opponent of the Avengers through the course of comics history. You pretty much let, like, your your ultimate guys are Thanos, Galactus, and uh, Ultron. We have um, Avengers 2 coming up next year uh, with Avengers Age of Ultron. But <laughs> that's confusing because you have this plot that you're building to for the Avengers movie but already you have you had Iron Man 3 and now you got Thor and with Thor you're setting up something that we got going on for phase 3 way down the line. Now it's being said that Thanos and obviously this character as played by Benicio del Toro the collector who is famous for collecting things through the galaxy particularly he's a few times tried to collect the Avengers himself. By the way, did you guys also think that Benicio del Toro as the collector looked a bit too much like Mugatu from Zoolander. I'm gonna let you think about that for a second. But we're setting up this uh, event for Phase Three already, um, even with the first Avengers. So I'm wondering if people are going to be lost, or if it's going to be used in uh, Agents of Shield. Or I know that uh, they just announced Disney and Marvel will be pairing with Netflix to give us an e an additional <laughs> um, series of stuff. So these other four Infinity Stones, we don't know what they're going to be, but they could be spread all throughout this Marvel movie TV universe. Uh, so your guess at this point is as good as mine. Did you guys like Thor? Um, did you guys do you guys agree with uh, John and I on uh, how the movie turned out? What did you want to see? Uh, do you want to see something different in an upcoming Thor movie? When do you think we're going to get another Thor movie? In the meantime, you can subscribe to Young Folks. You can follow our Twitter. Like us on Facebook. we got a Tumblr, too, for all you Loki fans. I know you're all there. Um, and you can co comment below, please, guys, to give us some feedback. Um, we want to make some more stuff for you guys. So let us know what you want us to talk about, seriously. Um, and then I'll be back with Allie next week. So that's it.
See ya.